All right, welcome. Well, I'm excited to talk to you tonight about low vision, what the definition of low vision is, and uh, what do you do next once you find out that you have it. So I'm an optometrist and I specialize in low vision. I've been um, in uh, colleges of, of optometry for most of my career in low vision. And then more recently, in the last few years, I've gone into consulting with um, on research projects and on um, um, ways to measure vision when we have some kind of a treatment or something for low vision or visual impairment, or maybe an eye disease. We need to measure whether that treatment is effective or not. So I, I work on tests, developing tests and so on that, that measure that. But I joined UCI just uh, a couple of years ago and we've started a low vision department within um, the ophthalmology department at Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. We have a couple of sponsors for tonight. Thank you so much for sponsoring us. Um, Idaptic, which is um, a head mounted video magnification unit. It's really uh, an augmented reality type of device that helps you magnify objects at the distance and near and has auto zoom. It's a pretty amazing device, but full disclosure, I do consult for the company, have designed a study for them and an, an advisor. And then Horizon, that is a pharmaceutical company that works with um, certain therapies for eye diseases. So thank you again for your sponsorship. So let's talk a little bit about low vision and the definition of low vision. So it can be a field of vision problem. It can also be where you have real issues with contrast sensitivity. And that means when um, objects in your world around you are not high contrast like black and white, but they're shades of gray or shades of color, it can be very difficult to see them against the background. And that can really cause problems with mobility, cause fall risk and trip hazards and such when you can't quite see the elevations in the ground or stepping off of curbs, you can't tell how deep something is. We really depend on shades of coloring to give us uh, cues about depth. So when you have contrast loss, that can be a real impairment. Now you might have a condition that actually impacts all three. And then of course that's a doozy and we've got to address that and see what we can do to maximize or help your vision. But sometimes it may just be one or it's an early stage of a disease where one part of that is affected. So um, let me just find out about our audience, you know, who, have, who is attending, um, how is low vision impacting your life? So I'm, I'm curious as to, you know, why you're here or why you're listening. And so there's a poll here. And um, if you can respond to that poll, and it's, I, I've been told by a doctor, I have low vision. I think I have low vision. So based on the definition I gave you just now, both eyes are impacted to some degree, small or large field of vision, central vision. Maybe you care for someone with low vision or you're just curious about it. You know, you hope you don't have it, but maybe um, somebody in your family has had vision loss and you're concerned about your own vision loss or you want to prevent it. I'm not gonna talk much about prevention today, really not at all. It's really about if you have the condition, but uh, there'll be other community lectures that really talk about some prevention and health measures and so on in the future. Good, we have some good responses. About 27 of you have responded so far. And so yeah, we have a nice distribution. We have uh, probably half the group that's, that's generally interested in eye health. So thanks for attending, that's great. I hope I don't bore you too much and hope you, you learn something. And so if you have a friend or anybody that you might come across who is visually impaired, you might understand a little bit more about what they struggle with. Um, and then uh, several of you care for someone with low vision and um, some of you have low vision or you, you've been told you have, so okay. So let's go on and let's look at um, uh, a little different view of, of eye care and vision. So in general, I'm gonna close out our little poll. Um, this figure, if you have difficulty seeing it, um, I'll describe it for you as well. Um, so there's two halves to this figure or this, this chart, so to speak. This is from Colin Brander, who, who um, is a great doctor who's been working in vision impairment for quite some time. It's an ophthalmologist. There's not too many ophthalmologists who practice low vision. It takes quite a bit of time um, working with patients. And so often they're working with surgical skills or maybe a different type of specialty. Most of the time, a low vision doctor is gonna be an optometrist. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. But um, this doctor produced this slide and this graph, and I really like it because it's a, real, a more holistic view of things. So if we think about the eye as a structure, the left side is really about the eye and kind of the organ of the eye and the part of the eye that might be really problematic. So if you have macular degeneration, which is one of our most common causes of visual impairment, you have a scar or atrophy or something going on with the actual tissue in the back of the eye in the retina. Um, if you have glaucoma, it's a little different impact to the tissue, but it's still part of the eye, the organ itself. 
uh, maybe you have corneal problems, and so that's going to be the very front of the eye. So different surfaces, different layers of the eye, and of course, they're specialists for just about every type of disease that you have. And at Gavin Herbert Eye Institute, we have amazing specialists in each of those types of um, field. So they're really looking at the eye, the tissue of the eye, and how can we stop it from bleeding or leaking or degenerating further? Um, and that's a very important skill for them. Um, and that might be surgical, it might be drug related, or however the, the, the approach of, of treatment might be. Maybe it's just watching it because there is no treatment. Um, but how that scar or that tissue that's impacted, how it actually impacts the eye itself, um, that's where we can measure the function of the eye. So visual acuity, a test of visual acuity is black and white letters. Um, that's the most classic thing that we think about is kind of this one measure. And it's the most common thing you hear about. My visual acuity, that's what I'm testing, and that's what the doctors look to see if things are staying the same in, in many situations. But visual acuity is only part of the story. We also look at visual field, which is, again, is, is where are your blind spots, whether you have reduced peripheral vision or whether it's right in the center of your vision that's affected, and those other issues of co contrast and color that I mentioned just a little bit. So if we can measure those things, we have a better idea of the overall function of the eye. But that's still an eye. And then there's two eyes. So how the two eyes work together in the brain is, is very complicated. But of course, two eyes are held together in a person. And that's what's really important, is how does the impact on the tissue and the eye itself and the function, how does that impact your ability to do daily activities? So this term, activities of daily living, is a very important term because it kind of captures what do you do during the day? What's important to you? So is it job performance? You need to see your computer. You need to be able to talk to people in meetings. Is it driving your car? Are you retired? But you're still very active and you're going to... Um, um, the gym and you're going to social groups and um, conferences or you're on board, you know, boards and things like that. So in all the roles that you do, taking care of your food, preparing your food and your medication, those are activities of daily life. So we want to know how are those impacted by your vision? And that's what we're really going to try to help you with. So if you sat down on my exam chair, we would really talk about what do you do during the day and what's number one, two or three things that I can really try to help you with. What is it that you're having difficulty with? And number one comes up is reading. Reading small print becomes maybe one of the first things that is, is impaired, especially in something like macular degeneration. And then maybe driving comes up, walking where you can't quite see the ground very well, falls. Sometimes we don't even think our vision's related to falls and, and it can be very related. So what are those things that, that are impacted? And then how does, how it impacts me, you, the patient, me, the person with low vision, how does it impact society? How does it impact my ability to go out and participate in society? Often we isolate and depression is a really big issue with, with low vision and visual impairment. As a provider, as, as a caregiver, care provider, I don't want that for you. I want you to be as involved as possible in all the activities that you've been used to doing. You might have to do it a different way, but we definitely don't want isolation. We don't want you to lose your job. We want you to be empowered to do those things. We want your quality of life to be amazing. Um, and sometimes there's other things affecting quality of life. It's not just vision, but vision can be a real, real, real um, impediment to um, having good quality of life. So when now we think about how the person functions and how the eye functions, there's a lot there between those two. And typically in an eye exam, we're not really, in a regular eye exam or even with your specialist, you're not getting onto the right side of the chart very much unless you tell your doctor, oh, this is impacted and they listen to you. But sometimes they're moving fast and, and, and intense and they're really focused on your particular eye and condition and maybe don't, aren't listening or you're not, not talking about your daily activities very much. So that's where um, low vision can be a big help. So let me find out from you guys what activities are the most impacted uh, for you or you, someone that you represent or your loved one. So is it reading? It could be more than one thing. So you can, can have multiples, um, either all of the above or maybe one. I'm not sure how the polling, if it allows you to pick two or three choices but so if you know somebody with low vision even you just think about them what is it that you notice that they had difficulty with good so reading so far is is our number one so far about 10 out of 16 people respond with reading and that can be labels text computer monitor anything with small print but we're talking about up close and then when we talk about reading at distance, that's more of a distance type of task and requires a different type of a tool to be able to see that. So I want to start to differentiate for you between reading up close and then reading signs, reading when you're driving. Uh, it's a little different. That's kind of spot viewing. So difficulty seeing the TV is considered kind of a distance task, usually about three feet or so 
further away. Seeing faces would be another one that's not on this poll, but that's usually, if you have difficulty seeing the TV, you usually have difficulty seeing uh, faces, facial expressions, which is huge because it's how we interact with each other. A smile, a frown, uh, whether someone's you know, really looking at you deeply and so on. Okay, so we'll stop the, the poll now, but yeah, most people is difficulty reading and then all of the above is quite a few people as well. But everybody does, has noted something. I mean, six or seven people in each and the difficulty seeing TV and driving. So, all right, if the, these activities are really um, the ones that are, that are most um, impaired, then what we have to think about is how we're gonna help manage those activities. How can we improve those activities? So I'm gonna show you now um, kind of a sketch that I've created that puts things into some kind of picture form. I like things to kind of fit. I like a whiteboard where I can sketch things out and make connections. Whether it's ideas with connections, whether it's people and, and so on, my brainstorming ideation time. So this has a kind of a lot on it, but I'm gonna unpack it a little bit. And um, so on the left side, we to think about the diagram that I showed you before with two halves where you have the eye and the eye tissue itself that has the condition or the debilitation, the, the difficulty, the disease, and then you have the person, which is activities and also how they're involved in society. Um, it's similar here. So in the eye, you have a specialist you're dealing with, with managing that specialist, so managing that, that condition. So if I were to see you as a low vision doctor, I'm not going to dilate your eyes and really look at the retina and explore it because you just had a visit with a retina specialist. So I'm going to jump into, okay, what does that report? What did they tell me about? Um, and I know how to read those reports. I know how to interpret um, what it means if you're having regular injections for macular degeneration, or maybe you don't need an injection for now, but you're being watched every six months. In the meantime, though, whether you're still progressing or whether you're stable, we still need to help you to see something. You can't just wait forever and wait for things to stabilize and not be able to see your bills or pay your bills and so on. So sometimes there's temporary solutions while your vision might be changing, and, and other times there's more permanent devices or tools that we might introduce. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So the low vision doctor, I kind of am on both sides where I definitely need to know about the eye disease and how it's impacting you and your vision function. And then I also need to know how does that vision function impact your reading ability and your ability to see signs and TV and so on. And so it kind of crosses into both. But I'm doing a clinical exam with you. I'm sitting with you in the exam room and you're telling me about your life and we're going to do some tests together. But I'm not in your home and I don't drive in the car with you. And so I'm not really getting a full picture of the person and how you live and how your life is impacted by these and how my treatment options might enable you to, um, to increase your quality of life. So I need help for sure. And that's where other people come in, low vision therapists, whether it's occupational therapists who are trained in low vision, whether it's independent living skills instructors, there are certified low vision therapists um, that are not occupational therapists, but come from more of a social model. Um, and you have yeah, orientation and mobility specialists who actually have a master's degree in the specialty to help with navigation outside the home, whether it's navigating public transportation or whether it's going to the grocery store or whether it's just going to your mailbox outside your home, being able to orient. And usually that's when you have field of vision loss. But, but anyway, these are specialists that can be really helpful partners to make sure that anything that I'm trying to come up with to help you improve in, in activities of daily life and quality of life, I really carried out. And it's not like you would come for one visit and we've got all the solutions. It's a rehabilitation program, which means that we learn about you, work with these other care providers as well. They visit in the home and help. And, and sometimes they come up with really great ideas I never thought of in the exam room. Things, strategies for contrast, strategies for lighting, strategies for your computer station. You might describe it to me, but this person can be in the home and actually see it and explore it with you. And so, they might come back to me, these therapists, and say, oh, I really think they need this power of a magnifier, or I really think this type of a magnifier might work better than the one that you suggested. Fantastic, we are a team, and we need probably several tools to meet different needs during, throughout the day. Um, so my goal in my exam, though, is to really learn about your vision and your best vision, and then to, to figure out what tools and devices might be best, and then work with these therapists and other providers who can get a better, better fuller look and provide their expertise at home, and then they, we feed back together to modify that plan and continue on. So this care coordination is a really important role. So that's the big picture of medical model rehabilitation. Now you might come in and you might have met with a low vision therapist or a living skills instructor through different organizations that are nonprofits. 
And I'm going to talk about a couple great ones locally to us. And that's fantastic. But if you come in that direction and then maybe they refer you to me or somehow you find out about me through, I don't know, internet search or from your, from your eye specialist, um, somehow our two groups need to talk and we need to communicate. So I'm very open to that. If, it comes, if you come to me and you've already been to Braille Institute and these other groups, that's fine, but we do need to coordinate together because sometimes there can be overlap and confusion and which device is better and you told me to get this device and that person told me to get that device. So we really want to kind of work together and figure out what might be best um, for each person. So again, when I share my perspective, it's really coming from the specialist referred to the low vision doctor as a medical model of rehabilitation, um, but it can come from different angles, especially if you've been around in in Orange County even, and might have learned about different types of resources other than coming in this direction. And there's not that many low vision doctors. So it may be that no one's ever heard of who to refer to and they just, the, the specialists don't know where to refer. That could be very possible as well. Um, so let me talk a little bit about certain eye conditions that might be causing the low vision, the most common ones. Macular degeneration, as I mentioned. Now this can be wet macular degeneration or dry macular degeneration different pathways a little bit, but ultimately they impact, impact your vision, uh, your ability to do daily activities in a very similar ways. So we're talking about central vision that's impaired. And maybe at first it's, it's a little distortion in the center vision. Maybe it's some warpage with one eye being worse than the other. Um, and then at some point it turns into a blind spot. Now in blind spots, we always think when we look on the internet, we think about these big black splotches that represents blind spot. That's not really how we see things. Some people might perceive it that way, but usually it's empty space. It's just emptiness. And when something's empty, your brain doesn't really like that. So it, it might try to fill it in for you. You might think you're saying something when you're really not. And what happens then, um, there's a syndrome called Charles Bonnet syndrome, where you might actually have visual hallucinations where you actually see things that aren't really there. Some people have described white picket fences, others flowers in a garden, certain patterns and shapes. And that's, that's a condition from the actual visual impairment. It's not from um, dementia or any other cognitive issues. So that's a good thing to know. And it doesn't hurt you. It's just a little strange to have these visual hallucinations. It can happen in glaucoma and other diseases too. So that's something to look up, Charles Bonnet syndrome. Um, but generally, even if you don't have that syndrome, because we have this empty space or this, we call it a scotoma in the clinical world where it's a, a blind spot, you're, it's because your brain doesn't really like that, sometimes it ignores it. So you don't even realize necessarily where your blind spot is or where your better viewing spot, if you were had to kind of move that blind spot up out of the way to try to see somebody, instead of bouncing your eye all around, there might be a better location for you to shift your eye to use peripheral vision. So that's where we want to learn about that in the eye exam. In glaucoma, again, it can be a little bit different approach where it might be blind spots, um, but it may also be more faded vision and problems with glare, glare sensitivity, and so on. And in, in retinitis pigmentosa, we might have this tunnel vision where you have a uh, very small, vi little vision in the very center, and it might actually still be pretty good in terms of the detailed vision, but usually contrast is a problem early on, low light, um, in low light causes a lot of problems for people with RP. Um, and so and that would be a different approach when we're coming up with devices or tools or recommendations for this rehabilitation approach than someone with macular degeneration, very different approach. So it's super important that the low vision doctor understands the disease and then understands how it's impacting you in other ways. Um, Stargardt's is, a, is another inherited retinal disease, but it's kind of like macular degeneration, but starts earlier in the process. And so, um, uh, again, it has its own set of, of things that we would have to deal with. Diabetic retinopathy is also something that's very common and it goes along with diabetes very often. And so that has both blind spots and contrast loss and visual acuity. So kind of an all three issue. And stroke, as I mentioned, could be something like missing half your field of vision. And that's very tricky because now you might be bumping into things on one side. Um, and there's some other complications of stroke, stroke-related vision loss. I won't go too much into here, but I just want to acknowledge that that is part of low vision as well. That, that falls in that category. Just because someone can still read doesn't necessarily mean that they're not having problems with mobility or missing certain areas in their vision. So that would still be considered low vision. So another poll for you. Um, what is impacting your vision? Which disease is, is impacting you or someone that you know? Um, Maybe they don't even have low vision, but someone that you're at least familiar with. So you, I can get a sense for how familiar you are with these conditions. So 
So we do have this option on there with no formal diagnosis, but my vision is getting worse. That can be really tricky. You know, is it, is it glasses related? Once you have the best glasses on and there's still a problem, we say there might be something else. There's likely something else going on. Is it early stages of dry macular degeneration? But definitely a good evaluation. We'll keep seeking, keep seeking a diagnosis if you're not sure. Um, again, getting good glasses is very important. It's part of our vision, part of our vision exam. That really wouldn't be my role as far as just, uh, I'm not sure I need to get glasses. That would be an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. My role would be now that you have a diagnosis, now let's see what we can do. And we know that the disease is actually impacting you to some degree in both eyes, even if it's a little bit of vision function loss, then we would see what we can do to make it better. And I will look at glasses in my exam for sure, but I don't, you wouldn't just come to me for glasses. You would come to me because you have visual impairment and glasses might be part of that process that we're exploring. So most of you said, uh, well, 12 out of 31 who responded to age-related macular degeneration. So it is a more common, but glaucoma is up there too. And sometimes you have both. And when you have both, you just have multiple challenges for sure. So we need to unpack that and, and understand which parts affecting which. Um, and just recognize that it can. But we have a few up here with inherited retinal disease and some with diabetic retinopathy, a few with stroke. Okay, so we've got a really a broad range of people listening tonight. So I'm glad you tuned in. Um, okay, so let's go on a little bit more into what does the exam look like and what is it that we might be doing. So as I mentioned, we're looking at treating the eye and then treating the person, right? And so and somewhere in between, of course, is where low vision falls in there. But usually I'm not the one, right, doing the, I, the treatment of the disease itself. That's your, that's your specialist. But I'm treating the vision impairment and the person who has it. All right, so back to our little diagram. We've talked about the low vision doc, but now let's talk about what we would do in the, in the um, um, well, we'll talk about the exam. I, I forgot I had this polling questions, but so the, I've described the type of low vision services. Let's do another little poll real quick. And then, um, and then we'll go on and I don't think I'll have too many polls after that. And we'll talk a little bit more about the specific exam and so on. But what type of low vision services have you had? So you, you, Dale McIntosh Center might be a place that you worked with um, independent living skills counselors. Braille Institute has low vision therapists. Um, they also have many classes and so on. So maybe you've been to a class at Braille Institute or you've had another service at Dale McIntosh Center, um, but not necessarily for the vision impairment aspect of it. Um, so those two are nonprofits. There's, of course, the Veterans Administration has a great low vision services. So if you are, are a vet, then there's amazing services just even in Long Beach. Um, there's outpatient and inpatient type of services through the VA. And the docs who are in those programs are really skilled and they have therapists and so on. It's a really nice, well-rounded system. And your device is usually provided for no charge. Um, so that's amazing because when you're in the, not in the VA, the low vision devices are not covered by insurance. So it's really tricky. And so we wanna to try to get you the right tools for you that you can afford, but that are able to really enable you to, to do the daily activities that you need. And then about half of you have not used low vision services. So, you know, part of that might be that you're inquiring for somebody else, but maybe if it's for yourself, it's not uncommon for me to have somebody who's come to me and they've never had services. They've had vision impairment for five years and they've just kind of isolated and stopped doing things and just never knew that someone like this system is here, that there's someone like me. And that's very sad. So we really want to uh, change the awareness of the community that there are different low vision services. And again, if you enter through Braille Institute or Dale McIntosh Center, fantastic. But hopefully you also get a low vision doctor who can tie these things together as far as your eye disease and the refractive error and your glasses and prescription and customized devices. The, um, the private groups are amazing. And again, I told you, I, I really can't work without them extending my care. Um, but if you only go there, you're not going to get a prescription or customized type of approach as well to the devices. You might have hand magnifiers and tools that are great for you. And I might have recommended the same exact thing ultimately, but really wanted to make sure we have a well-rounded approach. Okay, so when you sit down, as I talked about different activities of daily life, we are going to... Um, really understand what your life is like. So a low vision exam takes about 45 minutes to up to close to an hour. And, um, and that's because we need to, I need to understand more about your living situation, your, um, how you, your vision situation. Now I can read your chart and that gives me quite a bit of information, but sometimes you come and it's from an outside source and I don't have many notes. And so I'm gonna ask you more questions about your condition. 
Um, but maybe it's affecting you in terms of depression and cognitive status might be a factor as well. Maybe you have early diagnosis of, of dementia. Well, that's going to really impact how we approach the complexity of a rehabilitation program. It might have to be a much more simple approach in terms of maybe just glasses or a single magnifier that really doesn't take much training or learning, relearning. Um, and then, you know, we want to know about uh, how many times have you fallen and could it be related to vision? Do we need to do some more education and guidance and, and even some consider some things like a cane or a support cane to even help with some of this, this potential fall risk? Might even be changing out your glasses from a bifocal to single vision, two pair, a distance pair and a near pair, so that when you walk, you don't have the bifocal that might possibly distort the ground when you're walking. So combining visual impairment with a bifocal when you're walking can be, increase your fall risk. So we look at those things. Progressive lenses that are very convenient, like mine, go from top to bottom, you have a reading prescription, but they can't be made extra strong in the bottom. So we're not able to do a magnifying power with progressive, and it does kind of distort the bottom, the lower part of your uh, view. So it can be a part of the fall risk. So we might recommend distance glasses. If you're very used to your glasses, we'll, we'll work it out, figure out what's best for you, but we want to make sure you're informed of everything. We want to, I want to know, what about your status of your glasses? How old are they and have they made a difference in a long time? Some people come in and they have cataract surgery and so they didn't need much, but, but maybe they need a little correction. That just might do a little touch. But I have to say, this next slide I think is what I have in here. Um, no, it's a little further down. I want to just talk about um, glasses. Most people come and say, I just need stronger glasses. Well, the issue with stronger glasses, if I need to correct you so that the light from long distance, whatever you're looking at, focuses on your retina. That's the accurate prescription for you. And it might make things a little bit clearer. It may not, because with your vision impairment, it may just be a little bit too small of a noticeable change for you. But everybody wants the magic glasses. Can I see better if I just change my glasses? And maybe you have vision impairment and someone's told you, well, can't you just get better glasses? Once you have an eye disease that's impacting the actual tissue of the retina or cornea or wherever it is, glasses can only, they, they are accurate, they get to be accurate, but they're not gonna help you with that vision impairment. So how do we, what do we do? Well, we might wanna make things bigger. We might wanna use magnifying strategies. We can't do that with long distance glasses. It's focused for distance, it is what it is. If I were to add different lenses, I would make you blurry actually if I changed them out. However, when we come up to near, what we can do is change where they're focused. So we could make stronger reading glasses. You could read all the way up to one inch away from your, your glasses with a strong, strong reading ad. I can do that optically, but will you get used to it and will you be okay with reading this close with your nose hitting the paper? Probably not. Some people are, but probably not. So we can always look at stronger reading glasses. Um, but usually the hope is for these magic glasses. And I try to explain, look, there are no magic glasses. I, I will do little bits and pieces with maybe the glasses, but they're probably not going to be the answer for everything. So the other thing that, that we're going to do is we're going to measure your vision and really determine where your best, best um, views are, where your best areas are that you can see. So you might understand your vision and you might be very astute and be able to describe to me exactly my blind spot is in this position if i look up in this direction i can see better well, i can see your face fantastic but most people are not able to describe their vision quite that well they just haven't thought about it in these terms or thought about how to describe it but that is one of my goals by the end of the exam is to be able to get you to describe a little bit better what you can and cannot see and i'll help you with words that can help you describe that so it kind of puts something gives you some tools, a little bit of control for, around your impairment. It's like if you haven't had a diagnosis for a chronic problem for a very long time, and then you get to somebody who actually can put a name on it, a definition on it, it just feels so much better. It's not that it changed my situation, but it helps me feel like I have a little more knowledge. So that's what we would do around where are my better areas and what are my worst areas. So you might say to me, well, you know, I say, describe your vision to me. You know, what do you see or what can you not see? And it might be, oh, I can see somebody's face or I can't. That's good. That helps me. But you might generally just say, it's, I can't see. It's cloudy. It's dim. Okay. Well, that's the starters. But we need to define it better. And that's actually what I do in all of my research. When I'm trying to design a test to measure someone's vision and so on, we have to define it. We have to define it from a scientific perspective and from your perspective. So we might define it using this visual acuity, eye chart, which is the black, you know, letters and maybe the big E and, and so on is all you can see, but that's okay. We're going to measure it. And I have eye charts that go up to 
very large letters. So we'll always be able to measure it with something. We don't give up and just, I don't do count fingers. So some docs, if their eye chart doesn't go up high enough, they'll do count fingers or hand motion. If you can see something like hand motion, we can usually measure it with the charts I have. And I have charts with a letter, letters, the number seven that's quite large. And so that helps us at least get an idea of what you can see. And then we need to see where you can see. Is it out the side of your vision? Is it if you turn your head? Where is that best sliver of vision that you might have? Or a large area of vision? We're going to understand that. Um, that's really critical. And then also a measurement of contrast. So let me show you a couple of slides that have these things. So my visual acuity chart, I kind of, you know, you know a little bit of what that looks like. I also use a trial frame. So when you're used to going in to get your lenses checked and your glasses, we will check that. Sometimes we just check the better eye because the worse eye maybe is so much worse that the brain's already kind of ignored that worse eye. That's actually a good thing sometimes because if you have one pretty good eye and then you have a really bad eye, if your brain was really awake to both things, seeing both things at the same time, you would have two images coming in and out. You'd have a really bad one clouding your good one. That's called rivalry. And we don't want that to happen. Your brain doesn't want it to happen. So it already naturally tries to suppress it, the bad one. However, sometimes you have the dominant eye ends up being your bad eye. And that dominant eye is so used to taking over that it, the bad eye keeps getting in the way. And we find that you have a really good eye, but it's just kind of being minimized by the bad eye that's taking over. So that's tough because we need to kind of teach your brain to use the better, less dominant eye. So we might actually patch you a couple times, not, not for walking. We don't want to take any way, any peripheral vision for walking. We don't use an eye, eye, a, a pirate patch, but we might do a little clip on patch that helps the, the non-dominant eye take over just for watching TV, seated activities, doing your near work much less frustrating and you might already do that by winking the eye some people can't wink and so they're extra frustrated so we'll work on what we call strategic occlusion where we're trying to help the non-dominant so these are tricky situations that we need to figure out when you are in the exam um, and then a contrast test we might do something where it's just a reading test with a really bold left side and then a really dim or dull 10 percent contrast right side and so we'll measure how, how much worse is your reading vision with a low contrast chart than with a high contrast chart. Normally, we just drop a little bit. It's not too hard with low contrast when you have normal vision. But if you have a vision impairment, especially from like diabetic retinopathy or glaucoma, and maybe even macular degeneration, that faded side, when I show it to you, sometimes people say that I don't see anything there at all. There's no print whatsoever. Like, oh, okay, that's a sev pretty severe problem. So now I know, what are we gonna do? Well, we, a magnifier isn't gonna make low contrast print suddenly appear. So we might need um, a different approach, lighting, environmental solutions to try to make objects actually more contrast or video magnification that actually grabs a little contrast and provides an extra boost to the contrast that you see. I'll, I'll share a little more of that as we go on. These are a couple other tests. We might use a contrast test like the one on the left where the letters start out bold and then they get more faded and we see which one you can, is the last one you can see. We measure blind spots. I have a couple tests. I've helped to design this with another doctor. Um, and basically it's, um, there are machine tests that we can do, but when you can't hold your fixation on the dot in the machine test where you have to click that button, that's not very reliable, it doesn't give a lot of great information. So I'd rather watch your eye and see how steady or unsteady you are as you look at a dot for me, let's say. And then I use a little laser pointer to on a white sheet, and this little, these little two papers are examples of, once I've done this little laser pointer, I ask you if you can see each of my little clicks of laser pointer. And when you can't see them, I'm able to kind of draw out your blind spot. So we always map your blind spot and really get a physical picture of what yours looks like. And they're all a little different. I can predict some based on what you tell me, um, but a really tricky one is a ring scotoma where we've got a little island right in the middle, and then you've got a blind spot around it, kind of like a donut shaped blind spot, and then you have good vision in the periphery. So macular degeneration, there's a lot of these hidden ones where you have real difficulty with reading and small print, but you can do really great walking, any other problems. And so this ring scotoma is a real tricky one that we, we need to map and just determine what's going on. So what do we do in your low vision exam? We assess what level of vision you have and we need to figure out what your understanding of that vision is. So I understand it as we go on, but then it's also helping you to understand it. That's so important because this rehabilitation is not me about giving you magic glasses. It's about providing some options and tools 
that can help equip you so that you can do these activities of daily life more independently and enjoyably and so on. But it's really starting to change your patterns and giving you the right tools to do so. You have to understand where your blind spots are and you have to understand more about where your better areas are so that some of these tools work the best. Um, and then my job as well is to figure out the best ways to help you reach your goals and you learning about you, learning about what's going to work well for you. Maybe you're just super impatient. And you don't, you don't, do not want to learn how to use this particular tool. Well, then maybe we say, well, that's an option. If you're ready, when you're ready, in the meantime, maybe we can use this tool and maybe you can't read full books because you don't have the patience to really sit down and learn how to use these tools. But maybe we can get you to read your bills and we can get you to see essential information that you need. So maybe we adjust your goals based on what you and I learn about what you're willing to do and what you're able to do. And then we have people and these skilled um, therapists to help learning about other tools that might be useful, teaching you how to use the devices that are prescribed, coming up with other tools that are not even magnifiers. Maybe they're talking watches um, and a better phone that you can use, more accessible phone, um, or maybe it's a special lamp that they can get help get you in your in your home. So there's a lot of different things that we use these um, therapists and rehab rehabilitation professionals for. So it's your vision, it's your life. My role is to educate and equip you, um, and that's I need to learn as much as I possibly can to help equip you, and I need to be a good teacher in our exam so that I can share information that can be useful to you and specific to you. Every single visit is very customized. Um, but it requires new habits of you because these tools need you need to learn how to use them and how to daily incorporate them in your lives So sometimes we end up with three or four different tools for different things one magnifier for spot reading a bill Maybe special strong glasses for when you actually want to read something like a newspaper a lamp um, Some other tools maybe to help it be a little bit easier You need to use your little patch so that your dominant eye is not getting in the way so there might be three or four different things, usually there are, that we need to learn about. So that requires new habits and you being willing to change what you used to do. Sometimes there's this grieving process. There is a grieving process with vision loss. And so if you're not ready for the adaptation, it's okay. We'll start with the education. And then when you're ready to take on a new habit, you come back and we'll work on it again. That's why it's called rehabilitation. So, um, so are you ready? That's kind of the question. Um, now let's talk a little bit more about tools and devices. So once we've decided, hey, these are the best tools for you. And again, it's custom. So it's going to be based on what your vision level is and what magnification. This is basically like prescribing not just glasses, but prescribing magnifiers that are the right power. I've seen people with very wrong power, meaning maybe way too strong for what they need. And that means that they have a very small window to look through. Or it's too weak and they can't quite get enough what they need. Um, and then maybe it doesn't have a light in it. So the magnifier lens is okay, but without the right light, it's never going to be very helpful. So the right tool is very, is very important. So what are some of my favorite devices? So let's go through a little bit of that when you have different types of vision impairment. Um, and then we'll, um, and once I go through a little bit of devices, then we'll open it up for some questions and some discussion. So as I said, there's no magic glasses, but we do start with the best glasses possible because maybe we'll get an incremental change. And every once in a while, we might come up with someone who has it, who lost glasses 10 years ago, and maybe docs never really thought to, the glasses would help, and so they just didn't really focus on those or work on those. And so maybe there is actually a pair of glasses that could be very helpful. But we'll try to put in context, because all these things cost money, and we want to make sure it's a balanced. Is it really going to be helpful based on what your budget is? We don't want to take your rent away so that you can have glasses that barely help you. That is not the goal. Some people bring me a bag of glasses because they've had seven different pair in seven years and or seven months even because they've been trying to find the magic glasses. So we'll have to talk a straight story as well. And you have to be willing to, to hear me if I say, look, you have the best glasses that are possible. Now we have to have other options. And maybe that we need to prescribe the far glasses and near glasses, again, for fall risk, but also so that maybe we can make some magnifying reading ones that are special use. So let's say you have mild visual impairment. Things are just beginning to get a little difficult. Maybe it's the faded, you know, I can read newspaper, but only when it's in the sunlight. That's still vision impairment. And it probably means you have a contrast problem. And maybe it means that there's a ring pattern blind spot. So again, we'll explore that. But if you have mild impairment, then, you know, these are some of the common complaints that I see. Paying bills gets a little bit tough, or just once in a while it's hard to find it, but not all the time. Low contrast is probably a bigger factor for these kind of patients. 
And maybe it's even a driving issue. You're up for DMV renewal, you pr feel pretty confident and your family members trust you in driving as well. Sometimes you might be in denial that you can still drive and your family members are really afraid to get in the car with you. <laughs> so we have to have a straight talk about that. But state of California is actually pretty liberal about what you can do with driving with a, with a special restricted license where you have to show them, even if you have vision impairment, you can drive up to a certain point but you have to drive, you have to take a behind the wheel test and show them. So I would do the documentation to, to fill out what your vision levels are so that you could try to take a behind the wheel at DMV. So this might, this might be in that range. Some of the tools I might use again, might be a stronger reading prescription. Again, you have to hold it closer. A lot of people get my stronger glasses two weeks later, let's say, and they say, they don't work doc, they're the same. Well, that's because they're still holding them at the longer distance that they always did. But I say, remember, we have to hold them five inches closer got to have the light on there and sometimes we need to use this line guide some kind of a guide to help you keep your place especially if you have that little ring blind spot you can lose your your eyes jump and you lose place so we might need something to help you keep your place while you're reading i have some favorite lights a little this is a tip for you but lil larry it might be from home depot some people say they can't find it they can amazon has it 10 bucks 12 bucks very bright led lights i love this i took it from my husband's toolbox and i use it in all my eye exams now so this is a tool that you can get you just if you have a little bit of problem with contrast or dim lighting it's called the lil larry l-i-l-l-a-r-r-y but a really good lamp i have a couple amazing lamps these can be expensive i can give you pointers to get some on amazon or you can go through some of my my more customized distributors that have really nice lamps main thing about a lamp is a flexible arm that you can bend it and bring that lamp as close to the paper as you can. We don't want glare, but glare is coming in from wrong angles. A lamp is pointing it directly down at the paper and helping you get as much light as you can. Might even be just using your smartphone in creative ways. There's magnifiers on your smartphone usually, and so utilizing that can be a nice magnifier. And maybe just a basic hand magnifier. If you have a more moderate visual impairment, your goals or your issues or ADLs or problems with activities of daily life would be reading for sure, almost anything seeing anything on the computer. So it's not just little spot problems now. Now you're having more, you know, across every daily activity difficulties at near detailed um, objects. And you find that over the counter magnifiers are not enough. The lights never strong enough. Difficulty seeing faces print on signs is becoming difficult. We need to go probably into a little stronger magnifiers. That usually means the lens gets a little smaller in size, a little bit tighter to use, a little closer working distance. But we might be using an iPad still, could be a fantastic tool, love iPad use. Some therapists are amazing at training you how to use the iPad and even having some apps on there that can be magnifier apps. You might have really strong, the reading glasses, remember I told you could be really strong, so we might get really close up. Um, these are not gonna be where you walk around or look at the TV, they're just specifically for, the, for when you're reading. And it might be something like telescopic glasses where they're drilled into the glasses uh, remember I said you can't make your glasses any stronger. So in order to make magnification at distance, like seeing faces or watching TV, you would need to have something like opera glasses, binoculars. So they're distance magnification, magnification. but there's ones that are customized so that they do fit in the glasses. They still stick out though, and they still are obvious. So if you're embarrassed about it, it probably isn't the right option, but you can always see these and see that they're expensive. I mean, they can run a thousand to two thousand dollars but they can be customized to only one eye if you have one bad eye and the other one's doing pretty good. I mean, we do it for the, prescribe for the better eye is usually how we do in low vision. If we get more into severe impairment, this is where we're balancing some magnification and also some audio substitution. So optical character recognition, OCR devices where it takes text and converts to speech. There's amazing technology nowadays. Um, and the, the optical devices, they're gonna be so strong that it's much more a small view. And this is someone who's really been used to their vision impairment for a long time, can usually use these devices quite well. But we're probably more in the video magnification range. So let me, let me show you, video magnifiers is an amazing category where you have either desktop video magnifiers or little portable handheld ones like this lower left. Now we have wearables where we can wear them kind of like glasses. If you said these were magic glasses, this would probably be the closest fit, but they still don't look exactly like glasses yet. They're not totally clear. Idaptic, as I mentioned, was our sponsor tonight. And this is, this is an example of one of theirs. They have a newer rendition that's even a little bit lighter. Um, but we don't want something that blocks full vision. Now there are these um, kind of closed in um, head mounted ones that you could use if you're sitting down. Um, some people get a little dizzy with those or a little disconnected. So again, there's lots of different types of technology. We have OrCam, which is something where you 
point your eye and the device is on your glasses and it scans it and reads it for you, even signs in the distance, very neat options with our account nowadays. But these devices, they can be, you know, in the thousand to three to four to five thousand dollar range. So it's not too easy to get a donated device in these in these kind of categories. But you never know. There might be somebody who's who's donated and we might know somebody and so on. We've also had a telescope where it's implanted in the eye. And uh, I've consulted with this company, Vision Care, and learning how to use magnification of one eye and not the other. So you have one eye that everything is big three times, and, uh, and you use your other eye for kind of the walking around and seeing your peripheral vision. So UCI is a center that does do this procedure as well. And um, so that's for macular degeneration. So my role as well is to curate this technology is to learn what's come out what's new what kind of categories of devices might fit the best for you um and of course you know working with our groups of, of braille or dale mcintosh center our therapists and orientation mobility specialists to kind of bring it all together um so let me just ask you our last little poll here what level of vision do you think you have as we kind of talked about mild just being a little magnification maybe some lighting contrast and so on moderate really need some more magnification those over-the-counter magnifiers are not enough for you. Um, severe, you're really kind of crossing over where some things need to be read to you and spoken to you and probably need a large video magnifier to really see what you need to. And you're probably not reading for leisure anymore, or a full book that just takes so long, but, but maybe for smaller articles and things. Or field loss, yep, other field loss. Good, I'm glad that's in there. And then not sure, yeah, and not sure. Sometimes I'm talking to somebody, I did, did quite a bit of telehealth during uh, the biggest part of COVID, and I was trying to predict what someone might be. And then, and I thought, oh, I think you have, you know, mild, in my head, I'm not saying that out loud necessarily. And then when they came in, I was really surprised that no, it was actually just a really tricky blind spot pattern and probably more in the moderate. So it's not always predictable. And, and even for your loved ones, it's important they come to the exam and help understand what your vision is and why you're so frustrated with certain situations more than others. Okay, so we have a nice spread even here about whether people are mild, moderate, severe. Um, that's um, six, seven, and seven in the mild, moderate, severe category. So thank you for sharing. So I, I just want to make sure that we have a few minutes to, to kind of open things up for you guys and, and any questions that you might have. This first question is more of a scenario. It goes, I have macular degeneration in both eyes, the wet kind. I am receiving injections on a regular basis. At the beginning of June, my doctor switched from Avadazin to Ilea. I had cataract surgery in both eyes about eight years ago. The lens implanted in my left eye is for reading and the right eye for distance. Several months ago, I began having difficulty reading. I was told this was due to a formation of scar tissue. What is the cause of the scar tissue? Is this a subsequent development of the condition? Can anything be done to treat this? Thank you. Yeah, so that's probably a general term for the wet macular degeneration over time. So even when you have treatment, so Wet macular degeneration, you really have a leakage of vessels just below the surface. So the retina has many layers to it, very important layers, especially in our straight ahead and most central part of the macula. Um, and, and when we've, and, and macular degeneration really just affects that central part. So if you have macular degeneration, you're never gonna lose total vision. You'll never be in total blindness for sure. It affects your central part of your vision. Now, if you have a combined with other conditions, then, then that may be not, fully true, but it was just macular regeneration. Now, but that's still very debilitating. Obviously, it affects your central vision. And when you have wet macular regeneration, you have leakage of blood vessels. And the injections are aimed at drying those up. Is really, if, if leakage stays too long, really kind of blood, basically, but, but it's, a, it's a, a sandwich layer between the, the layers. So it's not just floating around in your eye bleeding. But let's say this leakage if it stays too long, it causes a scar. It basically, the eye, it's not natural for it. The eye has to kind of protect itself. So it, it builds up and it basically the tissue dies there. And when tissue dies, it forms a scar. So the injections are meant to dry it up quickly so that it doesn't leave a scar. But there's still a degenerative process that's usually happening, even if you're well controlled with the wet macular degeneration injections. And so ultimately there is a scar, even if it's early in the process or if it's a little later, it might be a small one, it might be a larger one. And that corresponds with the blind spot. So when I talk about measuring a blind spot, it's actually corresponding to that scar size in the back of the eye. And so um, 
so that's what they're talking about in terms of impairing vision. So it's not necessarily that the cataract surgery or anything else caused it, it's just the process. Even, even in wet macular degeneration under treatment, you can still have some scars. Okay, uh, we had one, another one uh, set in, or we have two more. Uh, have you had much success with stroke patients? Uh, they're a caretaker for one. Yeah, good question. So stroke is definitely complicated, as you know, as a caregiver, and, and it may be that, that stroke affects, um, it, it totally depends on where it is in the brain, right? Whether it's a traumatic brain injury, whether it's a stroke, aneurysm, some different things that might be head trauma related. Wherever it is, it may just cause a vision problem, or it may be a vision and language and um, musculature and so on, right? So every person, again, is unique in that. But let's say that there's no cognitive issues, no memory issues, but it just affects vision. If the if problem is on this side, then vision would be affected on the other. So it would be on the left side. If you're right side stroke, you'd get a left side missing field. Not everybody does. Could be a quarter of your vision. It could be a whole half. So classically, you have this half. And it's in both eyes. So if this is your visual space, then one side of your entire visual space caused by both eyes, both brain pathway. And so you'd be missing things on one side. So what I would do is try to first assess is what's the area of missing? Is there a little miss? It's called macular sparing where you can have a little better situation that's better for reading. And then we look at what can we do to help you with your problems with that, which is might be bumping into things. And then it would be, there's, there are some prism glasses that could be helpful in terms of bringing objects from the missing side more into your main view, but they're a bit complicated and, um, and we have to see if you respond to that. So we kind of explore that. It might be reading dish issues and the reading may not be because of, it could be because of the missing field, but it also could be because of cognitive, of, of processing of language, written language. And so we try to understand the difference between the two, if there's anything I can do with glasses to help that out. But it might be that we're using good lighting, we're using a, a ruler to keep our place when reading and really more strategy based. So it's always good to have a visit and kind of explore that um, and see what we can do. I think everybody who comes in for that, it's, it's not as straightforward as magnifying, but at least it can help both the caregiver and the patient understand more about their vision and the complexities of it. Okay. Uh, would you like to do one or two more before we... Let's do one and then let's jump to audience in case there's anybody who, who's okay. dying to ask them. All right. They're sending them in the chat. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, another question is, what are your thoughts on LASIK? Any potential short or long-term complications? Well, I've had LASIK, so I mean, it, it can be a really neat solution for functional, not having to depend on such a strong prescription and so on, but there's a lot of factors involved. I definitely want to have an evaluation with somebody um, who has a good reputation for taking some time and care and is a kind of a pop-up clinic. Sometimes clinics will brush a lot of people through, give a big deal, a special, but maybe there's not as much follow-up. But I'm saying that for somebody who doesn't have visual impairment. If you have visual impairment, we really don't want to do anything to risk anything to your eyes. So, we, so LASIK isn't really a good plan if you have another eye condition or eye disease that's going on. Part of it is that you're, you're removing some of the front tissue from the eye and flattening it out. So optically, um, that, that's okay. But the fact that you, when you go in with LASIK, usually there's a they, they clamp on the kind of the blade and it raises the eye pressure for just for a moment, but it raises the eye pressure. And so any, anything that can cause a secondary issue with your vision impairment or make it get worse or potentially, you don't, you don't want to do that. And, and just if there was an infection or a complication from the healing process, you don't want to risk losing an eye when you already have vision impairment. So when you have low vision, I say, let's try to stay away from LASIK. Are appointments covered by insurance? So I bill medical insurance. So typically, yes, um, there are some insurances that don't. But if you've seen somebody at the Gavin at Herbert Eye Institute, usually that same insurance I would be useful. So I'm not billing your uh, your like BSP or your vision vision plan. I'm not really doing a vision exam. I'm doing a medical specialized exam, kind of like your retina specialist visit and that kind of thing, because I'm managing your rehabilitation for vision impairment. Um, there may be a special fee for the refraction, the glasses part, because we're billing more of a medical exam than sometimes with a more extensive glasses exploration, there might be a fee that's, that's extra that's not covered by your medical insurance. Um, some insurances do both, but they like to warn about that. But that means also that the devices are not covered. So, 
but at least you know let's figure out there might be some ways and some programs that could provide if you do have low income there might be a way to provide some kind of a device through through different groups or programs that i might know of are you familiar with any support groups for individuals with macular degeneration and their families in la slash orange county yeah yeah so gavin herbert institute does have one um our Taylor, who works with me in the low vision department, she runs and coordinates it. It's once a month on a Wednesday. Um, Dale McIntosh Center has great support groups. Um, there's several across Orange County, so you can always uh, look them up and uh, find them. And then um, Braille Institute also has some support groups. Now, of course, with COVID, I think everything's a little bit remote. I don't know if people are doing some Zoom uh, ones right now or, or not, so you have to kind of weigh that out no one's really meeting in person but yeah those are at least three that i know of uh, across southern california once you have had scarring is there any way to improve the vision yeah so it's not necessarily a way to improve vision once the once the scarring is there i mean and that's where working with your retina specialist about you know uh, maybe studies that might be coming out and so on are very important but let's say that the, the blind spot is there it's, it's that means that there's dead tissue and there's not really a way to bring that back um, so any treatments are trying to help surrounding areas that might be sick, but not dead, help them to revive or last longer or slow the progression. When we work on low vision though, we're trying to find what's the better. So, so if we, you, you, what happens is the brain doesn't like to look at something that's empty or blind spots. So it shifts it and it helps you move the blind spot out of the way. So typically you have this, uh, it's called a preferred retinal locus where you're able to to view something by looking off gaze. You may not even know you're doing it. 80% of people don't even know they're doing it. But I try to find that and help you understand that your brain's already kind of pushing it up and to the left. And so, but maybe sometimes it's just not moving it efficiently all the way. And so it might be dipping that blind spot into your view and making things blurry or confusing. So the more you're aware of it, the more we can say, let's move it a little bit further out of the way. So what we're doing is teaching you how to use a better spot in your vision. And then once you use a better spot consistently, we can use magnifiers to make things bigger so that you can use your peripheral vision, a new spot. Our peripheral vision is not really well detailed, right? It's for movement, it's for walking around, it's for seeing some motion, someone coming up next to you. It's not really for reading, but we can kind of cheat a little bit and use a spot that's getting further out. We just won't have very good resolution. It won't, if you look at someone kind of sideways, you can tell they're there, but you can't see much detail about them. So if we use that new peripheral vision spot, we have to use magnification. So we need to be able to have steady fixation and we need to be able to magnify. So that's kind of two parts to the rehabilitation program that you start to learn with me and my teams. A macular hole, uh, parentheses oil procedure, led to virtual blindness and glaucoma post-op. Post uh, prescription eyeglasses, magnifying glasses, et cetera, do not help. Is there any procedure available that can help, that can provide hope to allow reading and distance vision again? Well, I guess the question is, um, you know, until I did an exam and found out how much vision was, was there after the, the procedure, um, you know, if it's really just a matter of light perception, and then it's true, probably no magnifying lenses. I mean, it, it just so it depends how much vision. When we're talking about severe vision, it sounds like it's in that category. There might be some tools you don't know about that might be strong enough to help you use a little bit of vision for very particular tasks. Um, so that's a possibility. If it's not, then it's when you have to go more into sensory substitution and use devices like the OrCam where it takes a picture and reads it to you and describes it to you, and so using other senses. But I really wouldn't know until I checked. So some people say, well, the, none of these things, I've had five magnifiers and none of them work. Well, have you been to a low vision doctor who's been able to go through the whole range of what's available or have you just been to maybe over the counters or maybe someone who um, just had access to hand magnifiers or very basic magnifiers so i guess it depends who you've seen and then so we really can't answer that i guess until it's further information